Drew has already given a really good general overview of IR debates. Um, it's on YouTube. Watch that if you haven't already. Um, I'm not going to just give you a second version of that. Um, uh, it's called training. Um, this will be a broad introduction to IR. Um, it, it is not a complete overview. Um, it would take hours and hours to do a complete overview of everything that is relevant to IR in Asia. Um, if there are bits you find interesting or you think that haven't been covered enough, uh, do do some more research on it. Um, this will start to introduce some of those topics and some of those areas, but um, it will definitely not give you all the information you could use in a debate about those areas. Um, because as I said, there's just a lot of information about that out there. Um, IR motions related to Asia are common in international tournaments, obviously particularly Austral's, um, however, Worlds as well, um, particularly when it's held in Asia, um, as well as all the minis that you'll be going to throughout the year, particularly those hosted by Asian institutions. Um, you may struggle to find debates on international relations related to Asia online, um, as the very valid reasons many people don't consent to be filmed in those debates. Um, that can make it a bit tricky to prepare for them because you can't watch really good debates on a lot of these motions. Um, so that's just kind of a warning that it, it, it's one of the areas that is quite prevalent but has very few recorded debates you'll be able to watch. Um, as I said, if you have any questions throughout, please ask questions. Um, I may have missed something that seems that I, I thought was, you know, something that everyone would know or that if, if I do that, please ask a question so that it all makes sense. Um, just quickly, important components of IR motions. Actor analysis is really important in IR motions. You need to know who the relevant actors are, what their motivations are, um, why they'll act in a certain way, what the outcome of that is. Not all IR motions are actor motions. Lots of them are, but not all of them are. Actor analysis is crucial even when they're not actor motions because what an actor is going to do will impact how how the debate plays out effectively. Um, so even if it's about whether something is a good idea, how the actors will respond, for example, to that idea or that action um, is still going to be very important in that debate. Um, so we're going to cover a couple of things in this top in this presentation and hopefully it won't go for too long. Um, so we're going to start with Korea, looking at then China, particularly the one country, two systems, onto Taiwan, ASEAN and then some new developments, including one that I had to add after watching the news this morning. Um, as I said, this list is not exhaustive, exhaustive. particularly China has significantly more to cover um, the issue of Uyghurs and the um, internment camps, um, US-China relations, Belt and Road, that China is far, uh, would, I would struggle to cover China itself within a one hour session. Um, so I'm going to touch on how it interacts with other actors in Asia mainly. Um, however, there is more that you that will be relevant um, to China in debates. You should look into that if you don't know what any of these are um, or kind of the basics of what, the, of what they are. So if you don't know what the Belt and Road Initiative is, have a look into it. It's fascinating, but it also, there's a lot of information about it. Um, so I don't wanna try and overwhelm you too much in this, to in this presentation. So firstly, Korea. Um, so there's a map on the right for people who don't know where it is or where the split is. Um, for some brief history that's kind of relevant for where it is today, um, before World War II, it was controlled by Japan. Um, Japan, as you'll find from a lot of these, was the imperial power in Asia pre-World War II. Um, they controlled a lot of area, but Korea was one of the main places they controlled. Um, Post-World War II, the Soviet Union and the US basically split a bunch of places. The most commonly understood is um, Germany with East and West Germany. However, Korea was very similar. Um, it was split along the 38th parallel, which you can see is the line across the middle of that map there. Um, that lasted very little time before the Korean War broke out. Um, Korean War, fascinating, however, long story short, it basically led to a the return of the current DMZ, which is almost along the 38th parallel. Um, it is, the DMZ is the demilitarized zone. It's a four kilometer wide, heavily militarized area um, that is particularly relevant in um, Korean 
uh, kind of discussions. Um, yeah. Um, so that is it, it, it basically all discussions and all kind of stuff happens along the DMZ. So in particular, there's one location um, where meetings are often held. Um, so that's where, for example, Trump met with Kim Jong-un um, and it's where a lot of those negotiations happen along that particular area. Um, there are also crossings and those kind of things that happen, but that's probably beyond this. In terms of South Korea, um, they're a capitalist democratic state that's aligned with the United States. Um, they're a slightly flawed democracy, but they're a pretty good democracy for Asia. Um, they're a highly developed country. They're the third most developed country in Asia, in fact, um, after Japan and Singapore. And their economy was very underdeveloped after World War II. Um, they started out as a very poor nation with actually very similar to North Korea um, in the economic kind of situation. Um, they are a really good example of where aid has worked really well. So a lot of countries, particularly the United States, gave quite a bit of aid to South Korea. Um, that meant that once they kind of got that aid, they were able to skill up their population. They've become a highly skilled uh, country that has led to them being highly developed. Um, in any aid debates, you'll find examples of where aid has not worked and has worked. South Korea is probably the best example you'll find of where it has worked. Their population is about 50 million, of which half live in Seoul. Um, the main thing to note about Seoul is it is incredibly close to North Korea and the DMZ. Um, so there's a lot of discussion often about long-range missiles from North Korea. Seoul is at risk of being hit by short-range missiles because it is only about 50 to 100 kilometres away from North Korea. So whenever there's discussions about kind of North Korean aggression to South Korea, Seoul, a city of 25 million, could justifiably be wiped out incredibly quickly. Um, and that is one of the hardest things to deal with in a career debate, is how you make sure that you kind of balance up 25 million lives in a particularly small area that could be destroyed quite quickly, unfortunately. Um, South Korea, despite the fact that they're allies with the US, still has a really poor relationship with Japan which largely stems to the um, pre-World War II era where Japan were the colonizers of South Korea uh, at the whole of the Korean Peninsula. Um, despite that, they do have quite a strong trade between the countries. And while they generally have very strong political disagreements and cultural disagreements, um, trade is a strong link between them and they are very strong trading partners, uh, which is uh, quite important for how the economies of those two countries work. Um, North Korea. So everyone should have a fair idea of North Korea. They were generally aligned with the uh, Soviet Union. They're now mostly aligned with, uh, with China. However, they're not quite aligned to the same extent. There are differences between what China wants and what North Korea wants. Um, authoritarian and communist, uh, very underdeveloped country. They're the least developed country in Asia um, and the only countries in the world that are less developed are the poorest African nations. Um, kind of around Central and Northern Asia, uh, Northern Africa, sorry. Um, almost every Western nation has had sanctions since they did their first nuclear test. Um, that has crippled their economy further than it already was. Um, the interesting thing to note is that China also has put sanctions on North Korea in the past for nuclear testing. So it isn't that just the West is trying to control, um, but it is actually that even China, um, their biggest ally in effect, is also slightly wary of the nuclear testing and power that they have. Um, population 25 million, so it's about half the size of South Korea. Um, but despite that, they have the fourth largest active army in the world and a third of the population is military, including reserves. So it's often, you'll often hear that North Korea has the largest standing military in the world. Um, that refers to all the reserves because a quarter of the population or a third of the population is military. <coughs> Um, North Korea is ruled by the Kim family. So originally it was Kim Il-sung who came to power um, post World War II. His son was then Kim Jong-il, whose son is Kim Jong-un. Um, it is very much a family controlled uh, country as I'm sure most of you are aware. Um, and that has some interesting kind of interplays with how the military works um, and how the actions of North Korea can very much be decided based on what 
the current leader of the Kim family decides needs to happen, um, which is different to what most other countries are. So, for example, um, in other kind of communist authoritarian nations, while what the leader thinks is still very important, there is still a recognition that other actors within that government or that state are important too, and that that authoritarian leader doesn't have all power over everything. Um, that is not the case in North Korea. Kim Jong-un currently has all power over everything. Um, so kind of a bit of a comparison. So North Korea is unpredictable and is heavily focused on nuclear weapons. However, it's important to note they operate in multi-year cycles of aggression followed by attempts to obtain legitimacy. So what that means is they will often have periods where they are particularly aggressive to the West. That will mean they have more nuclear tests. They might have long range missile tests. Um, they might do all sorts of things that they see as kind of making them seem stronger um, and making them kind of more antagonistic to particularly the West. Um, that is then followed by periods of attempting to basically achieve international legitimacy and try and get some kind of legitimacy into the future effectively. Um, that's kind of recently been on the obtaining legitimacy side with their negotiations. So um, Kim Jong-un became the first North Korean leader to meet a US leader with Donald Trump. Um, there's been kind of at the uh, Winter Olympics that were held in South Korea, they had a joint Korean um, ice hockey team uh, women's ice hockey team. Those are things that were done as a uh, kind of way of trying to obtain legitimacy by seeing that, by making it seem that they are reasonable actors and they are legitimately another country that should be helped. Um, what is likely to happen at some point in the future, if previous cycles have occurred or continue to occur, sorry, um, you will get a period of aggression where they'll do more nuclear tests and they'll do more long range missiles and they'll stop a lot of that dialogue. Um, when that happens is hard to say, however, there's been a kind of fairly continuous cycle of that occurring, um, not on a set five years, for example, but it is a multi-year cycle. Um, while North Korea and Ch while China is effectively North Korea's biggest supporter, it's important to note that China is not completely supportive um, and is, it is not kind of agrees with everything that North Korea agrees with. So Xi Jinping, the Chinese Premier, has forged a closer relationship than his predecessors had uh, with the North Korean leaders. However, um, China and under Xi Jinping has actually implemented sanctions, as I mentioned earlier, um, in response to nuclear testing. The main consideration, which is often kind of looked at from a Chinese perspective in the Korean peninsula, is that China doesn't want a US ally, being the South Korea, to have a direct land border with them. So China feels safer knowing that the only way that the United States or the West in particular can kind of access China is via sea because they know that it's much harder to do a, a maritime invasion, for example, than it is to do a land invasion, which would be possible if you had South Korea directly on the border. South Korea has some joint US um, military bases. Uh, that's something that China does not want to see. And that's largely why they tolerate North Korea, even when they don't actually agree with everything they're doing. Um, as I mentioned, Seoul is within 100 kilometres of the DMZ, so it could be attacked by short range missiles, um, which having a city of 25 million people at that risk is a very clear harm um, in a lot of debates that are around Korea. Because um, realistically, if you're able to explain the, like the harm of 25 million people or even you know a, a, a section of that city being destroyed or attacked that is an incredibly strong harm that is hard to overcome um, from an other from the other side of the debate moving on to china and one country two systems so this is usually discussed in the context of hong kong but it's also re relevant to macau um, hong kong is a, has a population of about seven and a half million. It was a British colony um, before it returned to Chinese rule under one country, two systems in 1997. Um, so the, the British came in around the 1800s, uh, the final kind of, uh, and had various negotiations with the then imperial Chinese regime uh, that was a particularly weak Chinese regime compared, compared particularly to the current um, Chinese political system. 
uh, they kind of gradually got more and more land until they got what is now Hong Kong, um, including the new territories which, and Kowloon, which is on the mainland, but is considered part of Hong Kong. Um, Macau which has a population of around half a million, was a Portuguese, Portuguese colony before being returned to Chinese rule under one country, two systems in 1999. Um, Portugal had operated that port for around 400 years before they returned that to China. One country, two systems was an agreement that on the return to Chinese rule and for at least 50 years, Hong Kong and Macau would be part of China, so the one country part, but would operate under the existing economic and political systems that existed in those cities. That is the two systems part. So what that means is Hong Kong, rather than using the Chinese currency, has the Hong Kong dollar. It means that the judicial system and the legal system are separate from the mainland Chinese judicial and legal system. Um, that was important because that meant that they effectively got a lot, a number of rights in those two places that mainland Chinese people didn't have access to. So starting with Hong Kong, originally a British deep sea port, um, that it is still a major shipping uh, port and that's one of the main reasons it's actually quite uh, wealthy but it really became a global financial center um, and particularly became the link between the Chinese and Western economies because it was the way that the West could get money in to invest in China um, and that China could also get money out and invest that elsewhere. Um, in 1997 when Hong Kong returned to Chinese rule Hong Kong was about 18 percent of the entire Chinese economy. Considering the size of Hong Kong, which is now seven and a half million people, slightly smaller then, and mainland China at 1.2 or 3 billion people, that shows just how wealthy Hong Kong was compared to the rest of China. It is now about two and a half percent. So that is still significantly wealthier per capita than the rest of China. However, the total effect of the Hong Kong economy is significantly smaller. Part of that is that the what was formerly effectively the financial centre to get money in and out of China and to have uh, kind of trade with China has been replaced with Shanghai, which has been which has become the centre of financial like the financial hub of China. Hong Kong still has value and importance um, in that financial space. However, a lot of that has been taken over by Shanghai. While we say 2.5% of the Chinese economy though, that is still big enough to be 30, the 33rd largest economy in the world, similar to Ireland, Singapore and Malaysia. Um, that just shows you how wealthy this 7.5 million people area is. Um, previously, uh, at, so 50 years ago, for example, just over the border from Hong Kong was really not much. Um, there was really, it was very much rural farmland. Um, there was not a major population center. Shenzhen has been built as a large industrial kind of center uh, with a focus on kind of trade and manufacturing that has a population of 12 and a half million. So what that means is there's now a city just over the border from Hong Kong that has, that is almost double, 5 million more people than in the entirety of Hong Kong. Um, that has large effects on how the population work and how a lot of the interactions between locals in particular um, and that has led to some particularly interesting uh, kind of ways in which China has worked within Hong Kong. So for example there is a train link between Shenzhen and Hong Kong um, that uh, I think uh, that I believe uh, it doesn't quite go to Hong Kong Island but it goes into barely central Hong Kong. Um, the way that has been set up is that now within that station, because there is passport control to get between Hong Kong and China, China now, mainland China has control over that station for the side that is not the passport controlled area. Uh, that at the time was particularly controversial because it was kind of the first step at which mainland China was retaking over kind of power within the borders of Hong Kong. Um, at, the, uh, at that point, it was not a particularly deep issue in that uh, to be in that area, you were already going to be going to mainland China on the train. So it wasn't like people who were just operating normally in Hong Kong were gonna end up in mainland China accidentally. Um, however, it still was quite a big issue at the time. 
Uh, quickly on Macau, Macau's only 33 kilometres squared, um, but it is the most densely populated region in the entire world. Um, it was originally a Portuguese trading port, as I mentioned, but it's now very much a resort city and the focus is on gambling. Um, gambling is banned in mainland China. It's one of the kind of enemies that Mao originally set up. So quite often residents from mainland China, particularly wealthy residents, will travel to Macau um, as a way to be able to gamble. Uh, uh, yeah, so generally a lot of people will effectively grown up thinking that uh, in the West, thinking that Las Vegas is the gambling centre. Macau is significantly larger in terms of gambling, like number of casinos, the turnover within casinos compared to Las Vegas. I don't have the number with me, but from memory, it's somewhere around five times larger in terms of the amount of money that actually transfers and gets take, it gets uh, turned over in Macau compared to Las Vegas. That gives you an idea of how much money actually goes into this really small area. Um, Macau has the highest GDP per capita of any region in the world, according to the World Bank. Um, it has bad income inequality, but the fact that its uh, GDP per capita is so high, uh, as I said, larger than literally anywhere else in the world, larger than Monaco, any of them, um, it is a very wealthy place. However, it is also a very small place and has a very small population. Um, actually, before I get onto that, one of the reasons that you'll see Hong Kong discussed much more than Macau, apart from the kind of large economy and the significantly larger population, is that Hong Kong has a very strong protest culture. Did have a very strong protest culture. That meant that there were significant protests that would happen not that uncommonly uh, across a, a very long period of time in Hong Kong. Um, coming into last year, the Hong Kong government, um, which the slide is slightly inaccurate, but is a, about 50% appointed and 50% elected, which means there is almost always a um, majority of the Chinese Communist Party aligned politicians in the government attempted to pass an extradition law. Under the previous system, because of the two systems, there's no extradition from Hong Kong to the mainland judicial system um, because it is run as a very separate legal system. So in Hong Kong, you have very much the Western, particularly based on the British uh, justice system. Uh, in China, it is very much a political run judicial system. Protests began with 2 million residents in June 2019 and continued for most of 2019. Um, as an aside, I happened to actually be in Hong Kong the day of that first protest. And I didn't, un uh, unfortunately, I didn't understand the significance of it while I was there. The only thing I noticed was that it was impossible to get a taxi because I had to get to the airport to fly home that day. Um, but it, the size of the as we said, there were 7.5 million people in Hong Kong. Two million of them were on the streets that day. That shows you just how much people cared about it, but also what that protest culture I talked about was. Those protests morphed from being about the extradition law only in kind of the first week or the first few uh, Sundays that those protests happened to become more broad, particularly regarding the police actions and wanting an investigation into the police actions in kind of closing down those protests, but also becoming more about democracy and the kind of uh, erosion of rights within Hong Kong. The extradition bill was formally scrapped in October 2019, but the National Security Law. So the National People's Congress, which is the mainland government, passed the National Security Law on the 30th of June this year. Those laws punish crimes of secession, subversion, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces with up to life in prison. What that effectively means is that anything that is seen as anti the mainland Chinese government, particularly with regard to how Hong Kong operates and will operate into the future, is now considered to be a crime that is now punishable. It demands disqualif disqualification for elected politicians who breach the law, um, which, uh, so originally Hong Kong was meant to have their legislative council, which is their government's elections uh, in September, so this month, uh, that's been delayed a year partially due to the coronavirus, but probably more so because of the long running tension um, and the kind of uh, protests that have been happening for the past year and a bit within 
Hong Kong. Um, effectively now, any protest is banned, while mil mainland intelligence can actually operate within Hong Kong, uh, something they couldn't do until this law was actually passed. Um, that's what all I've got for Hong Kong and two, uh, is it one country, two systems. We're moving on to Taiwan, also known as the Republic of China. This will take a bit of history to try and kind of explain this because it is a very it is a very unique situation um, but it is also very much a historical situation so taiwan has a population of 24 million um, it's a capitalist democratic mostly democratic state again it's classified officially as a flawed democracy um, but it is actually probably that's probably a little bit harsh towards it um, it it had rapid growth in the 1980s and 90s um, and transitioned out of a military dictatorship which ran it previously into the democracy that exists today. Uh, the time during which it grew, that 80s and 90s, is very similar to the time Japan grew, and it grew in a very similar way of manufacturing into a service economy. Um, it has a highly developed economy. It is similar in size, both size of the economy, size population, and per capita GDP to Australia. Um, it's almost identical in many of those uh, kind of factors. Um, it is the largest economy not recognised by the United Nations. So it was a member of the United Nations until 1971, but then in 1971 it was replaced by the People's Republic of China, i.e. mainland China, as the China that is represented by, uh, represented at the United Nations. I'll get to that in a second. China claims ownership of Taiwan and has the policy to force unification if peaceful unification is not possible. What that means is that the official Chinese policy is that, China, and by China, I mean mainland China, the official Chinese policy is that they will take over Taiwan and they believe they'll be able to do that peacefully. If they believe it is no longer possible for that to occur peacefully, they will militarily intervene to take over Taiwan because they believe that it is theirs and, and part, of, part of China. So what's Taiwan's history and how does this actually make sense? So prior to World War II, most of China came under the control of the nationalists, which are the KMT, um, while Taiwan was actually under the control of the Japanese, as I mentioned earlier, with Japan having sig significant power in the area. After World War II, Japan handed over control of Taiwan, but the new sovereignty status of Taiwan was disputed. Uh, that is a very complicated situation, and I'm not going to explain it because I'm not going to be able to actually do it justice because even I struggle to understand it. But after World War II, the Chinese Civil War occurred, um, during which the communists led by Mao defeated the nationalists um, and hence the Communist Party came to power um, in China and set up the capital in Beijing. The nationalists evacuated mainland China um, just before they were about to lose and, and moved to Taiwan. They made Taipei, which is the capital of Taiwan, the temporary capital of the Republic of China. And the KMT, while they were there, continued to claim sovereignty over all of China. So what that meant was the Republic of China, um, which was led by the KMT or the nationalists, which were kind of the capitalist opposition to Mao's communists, said they were the effective government over the entirety of China, being China and Taiwan. However, they had to, for their own safety, go to Taiwan because the communists had effectively won the war on the mainland. What this means is that both the Republic of China, Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China, mainland China, claim ownership of each other. So effectively, that is why the United Nations couldn't have both Taiwan and the PRC as members, because they both claim to be the gov legitimate governments for both, uh, for, the, for the same area. Most countries don't form official relationships, official relationships with Taiwan because they want to keep China happy. China does not think that Taiwan and the Republic of China is a legitimate government. Therefore, they make it very clear to particularly trading partners that they need to also do the same thing. So why doesn't China just actually militarily take over now? Firstly, unofficial relations exist with most Western powers with Taiwan. So while they are not officially recognised by most countries, there's only actually about 10 countries that actually officially recognise uh, Taiwan as a country. There are strong unofficial 
uh, relations with countries like the United States, even Australia. Strong economic ties, though, actually do exist by, between Taiwan and China. So there was a 150 billion US dollar trade between the two in 2018, which is 30% of Taiwan's economy. Obviously, that's a lot smaller in the context of China's economy. However, 150 US dollar, 150 billion US dollars is still a lot of money, and destroying that would have a significant effect on a lot of their economy and a lot of their people. There is strong travel between the two. Often many Chinese, mainland Chinese will visit Taiwan for a holiday. Many, uh, about 10% of people in Taiwan actually work in mainland China. There is very much a strong connection between the two, even if the governments are very diametrically opposed. Um, before I get off this, Taiwan was a fairly heavy topic last year because they had elections. There are effectively two political parties in Taiwan. There are the, the, effectively the nationalists who think that Taiwan should be a separate country and very much kind of following the KMT in that uh, kind of making sure it is a separate country. They are um, generally quite socially progressive. Uh, I believe they actually had the first transgender minister um, of any country in the world uh, under that government. The opposition, and still the opposition, is the China is the Communist Party aligned uh, party. So what that means is that they're more like they more want to actually get kind of a reunification of the two countries. Uh, it's not to say that that this the opposition party will just do whatever the Communist Party does. That's not the case. They are separate entities, and it isn't that just they like they're controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. However, there is a, a an alignment of the views between um, that, them in many cases. Moving on to ASEAN. So that's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So it's a regional intergovernmental organization comprising 10 countries in Southeast Asia. Um, that is Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, Myanmar, and Brunei. Um, if you look at a map of Southeast Asia, they are all the nations there. Um, the only ones that could theoretically be included that in Southeast Asia that aren't in ASEAN are probably Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea. Um, however, they are both very small economies. Um, and in the case of Papua New Guinea in particular, particularly underdeveloped nations. Um, ASEAN was originally set up by Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand and the Philippines. So five of the largest um, economies in Southeast Asia. Uh, and it was originally largely for three reasons. One, economic growth, two, regional peace, but also a bit of a fear of communism. Um, they were not communist countries. They were at least somewhat Western aligned countries in some cases or kind of not aligned countries in other cases. Um, but they kind of had a distrust of communism to an extent and didn't want that to kind of take hold in Southeast Asia. Important thing to note about ASEAN is that it does not operate in the so same style of political and economic union that the European Union does. So the European Union operates in an economic union in that they have one currency, the euro. Uh, there are no trade boundaries between the countries. There is free movement of people. Um, but there is also a political union in that there is a political uh, the elections for the European Union Council um, and the European Parliament that is able to make laws uh, and kind of do a lot of things that dictate how uh, the countries within the EU operate. That is not the case with ASEAN. Um, just to give you a kind of very brief, and this is very, very brief, um, kind of overview of the countries in ASEAN, uh, there is a range of different countries uh, and a range of different particularly political systems. Um, so there are one party socialist republics in Laos and Vietnam. Um, in saying that they are not necessarily aligned with China, they often have very different views to China and a kind of uh, not enemies, but they, they very much do not get along with China. Um, and they have kind of lost a lot of that socialist communist part and a, particularly in the case of Vietnam has probably morphed more into a technocratic um, authoritarian state. Um, you've got the absolute monarchy in Brunei. Brunei is a very small economy within and a very small place within Southeast Asia. Um, 
you've then got some weak democracies, um, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Indonesia, um, Thailand are all relatively weak, although to differing levels. Um, Malaysia is considered the highest. Uh, so the Dem democracy index is an index put out by a um, British group that basically ranks all the countries in the world according to uh, a bunch of situations. And they kind of rank democracies in who is the kind of closest to a pure democracy. Um, Malaysia is the top of that list in Southeast Asia, um, followed by the Philippines and Indonesia. Uh, uh, yes, we, they're, they're actually, Malaysia is rated the highest um, on the democracy index among Asian states. Um, all of these have very different even political systems, regardless of whether they're a weak democracy, a monarchy. Um, Singapore, for example, is nominally a democracy, is largely technocratic and autocratic. Um, they have not had a change of government in, I believe, the entire uh, period of the Republic of Singapore existing. Um, Malaysia has by far the most complicated politics of just about any country I am aware of. Um, it seems to change weekly on who's in charge. Um, however, that came off the back of one party having control for 50 years. Um, so they're in very much a transition phase. I, I would probably classify that as. Um, but then you've got countries like Myanmar, who, uh, again, officially a democracy, but uh, still under military control. Um, look into these if there's ones you're interested in. Um, but it just gives you an idea. They are very different countries in the way they're set up, um, whether that even be as democracies versus authoritarianism versus somewhere between. Um, yeah, there is a very big spread. So the ASEAN way. So this is quite an important way of looking at ASEAN is the ASEAN way. So the ASEAN way refers to the methodology or approach to solving issues that respect the cultural norms of Southeast Asia, but above all prioritizes consensus-based and non-conflictual ways of addressing problems. So what that means is there is kind of strong emphasis on national sovereignty, a commitment to non-intervention in the affairs of member states, but also, and probably most importantly, all decisions are made by consensus. So this is kind of the biggest way in which the ASEAN is different from the EU, is that for anything to happen from ASEAN, there has to be consensus among all 10 countries. I've already shown you how different the actual uh, like political systems within these countries are, but there is also other ways in which these countries are very different from each other, which can make getting consensus on almost anything uh, very difficult. Um, the different countries in ASEAN often focus on different things. So Myanmar, Cambodia and Laos, three of the poorest countries effectively in Southeast Asia, uh, emphasise non-interference uh, in a lot of the ways they deal with ASEAN. Whereas the older, older members, countries like Thailand or Malaysia, they often focus on trying to get some cooperation and coordination because they're kind of into that next step of a developing economy uh, compared to an underdeveloped economy. So one who look at ways like they and other countries in ASEAN can actually kind of build into a future. This Asian way uh, was a topic at, I believe, Worlds last year um, and is, is often brought up in discussions about Asian. Uh, to understand Asian, you need to understand this and particularly the consensus nature um, of decision making. So one of the kind of more common comparisons or topics on ASEAN is a comparison of ASEAN to the EU. Um, this was actually an ESL semi-final motion or Australs this year. Um, however, it, it is a relatively common motion in different forms. Uh, but one of the main ones to look at is whether ASEAN should form an economic union. So uh, I already explained the economic union in terms of the EU, but that means they've got the European Central Bank, they have the Euro, each country doesn't have their own reserve bank that can dictate things like interest rates and uh, print money and those things that a reserve bank can do. I, I won't turn this into an economics training session. Some of the main considerations that you need to be aware of when you're discussing whether ASEAN could be an economic union. I already, and I said, as I said before, I already discussed the differences between the governments in these, in these uh, nations. 
There is also big differences in the size of the people, the populations, but also the economies. Three examples which kind of show you the real breadth of the difference. Singapore, which has a population of five and a half million, is among the wealthiest nations in the world. Um, it is, uh, I believe, the second wealthiest, or th sorry, it, it is a similar wealth to Hong Kong, um, slightly less, I believe, uh, which really puts it as Asia's strongest economy. Um, it is very much trade focused um, and uh, but it, it, it operates as a almost purely service economy. There is no manu there is next to no manufacturing in Singapore. There is next to no farming in Singapore. Uh, there is next to no kind of primary production in Singapore. Um, it is very much that service and trade based center. Um, again, very similar similar to Hong Kong. It has a great deep sea port in a very strategic location. Indonesia has a population of 268 million people. Um, that is massive. Uh, it is, uh, and I can't remember exactly, but it is in the top 10 largest populations in the world. It is a developing nation with a newly industrialized economy. That means it has a kind of quite a strong, uh, what do you say, it, it still has a large agricultural sector. However, it is moving into that kind of future of manufacturing and taking over, uh, particularly where China is moving out and becoming too expensive to be the kind of manufacturing center for the world. Uh, Indonesia is one of the countries trying to move into that sector. Um, they, are, they have a decent tourism sector. Uh, overall, they are very much the kind of epitome of developing Asian nations. Um, Laos, on the other hand, population 7 million, so again, quite small, although a significantly larger area than somewhere like Singapore, is an underdeveloped economy based enti almost entirely on rice farming. Um, they have not got to the point of industrializing. They have next to no tourism economy, uh, next to no tourism sector. Uh, almost everything in their economy is based on rice farming. Um, if you compare that back to Indonesia, there's a big difference. There are some similarities in what they want and what they need, but there is a big difference. If you compare that to Singapore, they're, they're not on the same level. They don't have any shared interests. Um, the entirety of the Lao economy does not overlap at all with the Singaporean economy. Um, if you're looking at having an economic union, one of the reasons, and, and like the EU has some flaws, particularly with the economic union, but one of the reasons that it actually works decently is the fact that the economies between those between the countries in the EU are all relatively similar in that they are all developed or at least on the upper end of developing. Um, they all have, you know, decent uh, kind of uh, overlap in the things their economy does, whether that be manufacturing or service um, or kind of more advanced farming. That is not the case in ASEAN uh, at all. Uh, and it, it becomes a real struggle to be able to line up the kind of uh, in, incentives of the countries on either end of that spectrum. I'm gonna touch on this very briefly because it, it's relevant, but it's also extremely complicated. But the South China Sea is kind of one of the red button issues that comes up not that uncommonly, um, but, but as you can see from that map on the right, it, it is not simple to explain, like just visually, let alone uh, be able to explain in debate. The brief overview of the South China Sea is that based on that 99, 1982 convention, countries have an economic exclusive zone of 200 nautical miles or 370 kilometres from effectively the edge of their kind of the sea where like where their land finishes out which for a country like australia for example is not really an issue because it, it doesn't overlap with anyone except for a little bit around kind of indonesia and timor as you can see with this map it, it does overlap significantly um generally this is a dispute between asian and the west against china um, china has significantly larger claims than almost anyone else however as you can see there are there are also disputed claims between asian nations so for example there's a very small area um, which is kind of a cross between a few of them that brunei malaysia vietnam 
and the Philippines all claim to be part of their sovereignty. Um, that is obviously an issue uh, that you don't want to have to be dealing with. Um, the, the reason that this is particularly complicated is that firstly, as you can see, there's a bunch of islands in the middle, the Parcel Islands and the Spartley Islands. These islands are generally disputed islands. So what that means is that multiple countries often claim ownership over them. Um, the Parcel Islands, for example, both Vietnam and China claim ownership over. Um, the Spartley Islands are even more complicated than that. One of the issues that happens here is that China has been building a number of man-made islands in the South China Sea to be able to kind of extend their claim over more area within the South China Sea. Why this is a particularly important area is that it is a very important strategic shipping lane and it is one of the main ways that uh, freight in particular gets from China across the world and gets from places like Japan and even from America, uh, the, was it the west coast of America to the world. Um, this is an incredibly busy uh, shipping area. Um, I already told you that Hong Kong and Singapore are very big shipping ports. But almost all of the traffic that goes through both of those ports goes through the South China Sea. Um, there is also claims of significant oil reserves occurring within the sea. That is mm, disputed as to whether that is true or not, or just another claim people make. Um, there are some oil reserves, however, the size of them is um, could be anywhere from a billion, uh, was it a billion tons to ten billion tons? Don't quote me on that number, but there is a wide range of the kind of estimates of how much oil is actually in the area. So it's likely not to be the biggest reason why people are fighting over it. Um, you'll often hear about freedom navigation exercises in the South China Sea. What that basically means is that military ships just go through the South China Sea and make sure that they can get through without any problems. Um, the US does that quite regularly just to make sure that shipping um, navigation, uh, shipping channels are still open uh, for Chinese, uh, for sorry, American vessels. Um, but, but yeah, South China Sea is complicated. Um, if you want to read up more on it, do. Um, I cannot explain this in enough detail for it to be overly relevant. However, hopefully that gives you a kind of brief idea of the area and what the dispute is about. India and China. Um, so this is a, and again, I'm just going to touch on this briefly because it, it's complicated, but also it is very new. Um, it is both very old and very new. So it's a very current confrontation. Um, the background and something I'm not going to get into because I don't understand it as well as I would need to to explain it, but also it, it, as with many things, could take up an entire presentation, is that India and Pakistan have long been enemies do not like each other, um, and there are a lot of particularly religious reasons. India was set up as a Hindu state, Pakistan was set up as a Muslim state. Uh, that caused problems because before the British were there and before the British partitioned it, it wasn't that India just had Hindus and Pakistan just had Muslims. They lived interchangeably without any problems. But with that kind of brief explanation, Pakistan is China's strongest ally. So China has a way of ranking their allies uh, where it is, I believe, about six. I believe there's six categories. Um, the top category is basically for countries that will agree with everything China agrees with and will never oppose them. The only country that is in that category is Pakistan. Uh, that is how close their relationship is and how close uh, China sees Pakistan. Um, as you can see, Pakistan doesn't quite touch China in many bits, um, but there is that border with Tibet, um, with India. The conflict began on the border in June, so a couple months ago. Um, one of the important things to note here is that this was a Malay conflict, so no firearms were used because they didn't want any escalation. Both India, Pakistan and China are all nuclear uh, powers. That means that any conflict could easily become massive um, at the flick of a switch, basically, and become incredibly deadly. Um, combined, there is a population of close to two and a half billion people. Um, that is not somewhere you want a nuclear war to be starting. Um, as such, there were approximately 40 deaths uh, from that conflict. However, 
there were no firearms used. There were no guns used. Uh, it was a bare fist and with bats, effectively. Um, so a very, very rudimental uh, kind of conflict. Um, important to note, the Himalayas run, run along that border. So it is a very high place in terms of altitude. Um, it's a very remote place. Um, but there is kind of strong border uh, disagreements along there. That conflict continued. Um, there was actually an incursion yesterday. Um, so this is something that is very much become a very current issue um, and is something that may come up in debates in the next kind of couple of months in this year um, because it is it is kind of come from there wasn't there was always a disagreement but it was just kind of left there. Um, it has become active. India has retaliated in ways that have probably hurt a lot of the economic ties between the countries. Um, so India has banned many Chinese made apps uh, from uh, the country. So that included TikTok and WeChat. Um, obviously there is a big debate, particularly in the United States about TikTok um, and the kind of Chinese control over it and what should be done there. Um, India has gone ahead and banned not only that and WeChat, which is kind of just about the most important app in China, um, but also a hundred other Chinese made apps. Uh, this is something that you should probably just keep an eye on the news, see what's happening. Um, it's not going to go away kind of in the next week. Um, there will be stuff that will come up about it. Um, make sure you kind of keep on top of it because it could end up being something that kind of grows into something much more um, or much bigger. Uh, yeah. Journalists in China. So this I actually added this morning. As of this morning, there are no journalists working for Australian media in China. That is the first time in 50 years that that has been the case. Um, an Australian journalist was working, uh, working for state media in China was arrested last week. Uh, the remaining two Australian media uh, journalists who were in the country were evacuated uh, over the weekend and this morning. Um, they were quest they were Chinese police turned up and attempted to question them. Uh, they then effectively hid in the embassy until they were given permission to leave. China's also been refusing new press credentials for US media while expelling Australian and American journalists. Um, obviously, China is already heavily restricted to journalists. Um, as I said, this is extending to Hong Kong um, with the national security law. The focus of this seems to very much be on America with China as well. Um, but that's not to say that it is restricted to America and China and therefore just a retaliation to trade. Um, it has also happened to other Western journalists who have either been detained or kicked out of the country. One of the important things to note with China and the way they act in kind of a punishment way is that China will often, to another country, punish that country uh, for doing something, but they will never acknowledge that they're doing it to punish that country. And they'll also never tell you why they are punishing you. What that means is that a country can kind of try and guess what they think they've done that's upset China, um, but they will never know what that is. So China does that for a couple of reasons, but the main one is that it really makes the other country think about what they've done more broadly. And if there's anything else that they think they might have done that could have upset them, they might happen to also fix that at the same time. This, like, I, I doubt journalists in China will be a debate topic. However, it's important, particularly in the context of US-China US debates, to discuss the way that media interacts with that and what the restrictions on having uh, Western media in China has on many of these things. Because if you don't have Western media in China, it's very hard to report on things that are happening. Not that it's easy under the status quo, but it is that there are definitely issues of being able to get information about even kind of major political issues that are happening in China out to the world, um, it, even to the extent of getting news about the, the coronavirus in Wuhan. It was often media that existed within China that was able to kind of get the word out to an extent that there was something happening and something needed to be taken notice of. As a bit of a summary, every IR debate about Asia, you will almost certainly need to consider China. I did not discuss China re regarding ASEAN. Uh, again, uh, not enough time, very complicated. Um, ASEAN is not a single uniform body. Um, 
China has decent relationships with some countries and has particularly poor relationships with others. So, for example, Singapore is often seen as a very good neutral country between both China and uh, the United States. Um, that's why it actually hosted the first meeting between Trump and Kim Jong-un. However, that is not necessarily the case in the relationship between a country like uh, Vietnam and China, who have some agreements, but also particularly because of the South China Sea, have significant disagreements. Um, as I said, South China Sea, good example of where that really comes to play between Asia and China. Some further research I'd recommend, um, Economics Explained is a YouTube channel. If you haven't watched it and you don't understand you, uh, economics, I would recommend it. It's usually quite interesting, but it's also really good at explaining fairly um, useful economic concepts in a fairly simple way. Uh, they have a three-part series on China, but the one that I would recommend is the economy of modern-day China. It gives you a real understanding of how China came kind of built a, built an economy um, and how that's led to a lot of the power that exists in China um, and how that's led to a, a lot of the other things that kind of uh, dictate how China actually operates uh, and particularly looking at future kind of um, what you say like future challenges that China will face um, one of the main ones being the middle income trap uh, for those that don't know middle income trap is basically it's really easy to become kind of a middle country in terms of your economy because you basically start off, do some manufacturing, you've got the cheapest labour in the world, um, you build your economy, your labour becomes cheaper, suddenly you're not the cheapest producer of whatever you're making. Someone comes in and is cheaper than you, but you haven't quite got enough money to become a developed service economy and you, you kind of get stuck in the middle. Um, that is a risk for China. Um, China probably has less of a risk of falling into that than smaller economies. Um, however, I would recommend you watch that video just to kind of get a better idea. Um, it doesn't look like anyone's got any questions. Um, but yes. 